Okay, welcome. I'm going to do a series on a number of medications, at least 25, uh, in the children's OTC medication section. So this particular series, this is going to be an introductory video, a little bit longer, and then I'll have individual videos for each of the medications. And they're really only about 25 actual active ingredients in the children's over-the-counter aisle. So the topic is getting the right active ingredient in the children's over-the-counter abbreviated OTC section. And I call this the parent pharmacy workshop because that's how I kind of picture it. I'm a pharmacist. I've been a pharmacist for 19 years. And some of the, my favorite things to do, especially when I was working overnights, was to be able to talk one-on-one -on -one uh, with parents uh, when they really, really needed uh, someone to talk to and really needed guidance. So this parent pharmacy workshop, and maybe that image isn't the best, but uh, the idea is that uh, no lab coat here, we're just standing side by side, I'm just going to talk to you, a couple of things you need to know, and uh, this is just a chance to talk to you about all the medications uh, and then, you know, when you have time to watch, you know, on YouTube, uh, not when you're busy uh, going to get a medication or something like that. So let's start with the children's OTC aisle. Uh, number one, we'll talk about medication errors. When you go and get a medication from the children's OTC aisle, no one has to check it. You can just buy it, get checked out by the cashier. If a physician calls in a prescription, the pharmacist has to check it. If in a hospital, a physician orders a prescription, the nurse will still check it after the pharmacy sends it before it goes to the patient. But by going to the pharmacy, picking up a medication, we're completely skipping a very important step, which is the check. And many parents are distracted, exhausted, uh, and we'll look at the prevalence of medication errors. Second, why the children's OTC aisle is so confusing. It's pretty clear why this is. And I just have one thing I want you to remember uh, after this video, and I'm very clear, just one sentence, uh, and I'll talk about that in part two. And part three, uh, we're going to learn 25 children's OTC medications. I'm not gonna read you everything on them, but I'm gonna tell you what to look for, and just some clinical pearls, just a few uh, with the 25, but every time, every medication, anytime you pick up something for a child, you should go to the pharmacist, make sure this is the correct drug, and the most appropriate drug. We'll start with the medication errors. I don't have the rights to these journals or these publications, so I'm just going to highlight what they are, and you can certainly look them up. First, a uh, recent Johns Hopkins uh, public, it was published in the British Medical Journal, but it came out of uh, Johns Hopkins or a professor from Johns Hopkins, and they've announced that the third leading cause of death in the United States is the medical error. And to just summarize quickly, what you just want to think is when somebody has something really bad happen, when we write down what happened, we write down heart attack or seizure or whatever number of things that could have happened. We never write heart attack because of a medication error. We never write seizure because of a medication error. That's attributing blame, and we can't do that. So the medical error, uh, in general, what they're basically saying is we've underreported it, not intentionally, but just because of the way that we talk about things. The other one I thought was important was that uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics came out with this one. Every eight minutes, a child experiences an out-of-hospital medication error. And that's really what this whole video series is about trying to protect children from these medication errors with just a little bit of extra knowledge about the entire over-the-counter section rather than just saying, okay, I want to know about Tylenol, my child has a fever. I want to know about um, children's Pepto, my child has a stomach ache or something like that. We need to know about all 25 medications and I'll show you how to do it very quickly, very easily. So the first thing why, or the second, piece of this is why it's so confusing, why the OTC aisle is so confusing. And if we look at the size of the writing, I have presbyopia, which means that I have poor near vision. So I can't even read 
the back of most medicines, I have to get the cheater glasses or I take my iPhone, I take a picture and then expand it. This is the one thing I want you to take away if you turn this video off. The most important part, small font does not equal small in importance. The font size of the generic name, the active ingredient is the absolute most important thing, the right drug. And I want to impress that on you by looking at you know, the blow up of it. So every time you look at a uh, medication, you should always turn it around. Make sure you're getting the right drug. Okay. All right. Sorry, I had to close my door there. Uh, so why is it so confusing? Well, here are the 25 medications, and you can see that there are a couple of problems here. One, we've got 25 different medications. Two, many of these sounds are just not sounds we use commonly, and some just don't even exist in English, like sown and dean. We just don't spell that sound that way in English. We, spell, we pronounce D-I-N-E as dine or the sewn, we spell S-E-W-N. So a lot of sounds, a lot of things that are very uncommon in these generic medication names. So what I want you to think about is, instead of trying to tackle all 25 at once, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go one at a time, but we're also gonna categorize them, we're gonna group them together. Where do they come from uh, or where are they? And this isn't something you should be doing alone. The pharmacist is always there uh, if they're not, there's certainly a 24-hour pharmacist on duty somewhere, uh, probably the same chain uh, that you can call. So the learning the 25 OTC medications or children's OTC meds is going to come from breaking them up and knowing that they belong together. So the first six I'll go over are gastrointestinal, calcium carbonate, magnesium hydroxide, both antacids, docusate sodium, a stool softener, polyethylene glycol, very gentle laxative, Miralax, loperamide is an antidiarrheal, and then simethicone uh, is mylocon anti-gas. Then we'll go into the anti-analgesics, antipyretics. Antipyretic means anti-fever. Uh, anti-inflammatory versus non-anti-inflammatory. Uh, uh, acetaminophen doesn't have anti-inflammatory activity, while ibuprofen does. And then making sure to remember that there's an infant's formulation at, at times and a children's formulation at times as well. We'll go over first generation versus second generation antihistamines. In general, the first generation antihistamines cause a lot of sedation, a lot of drowsiness. Usually you find them in combination. And then second generation antihistamines, these are the newer ones. They don't usually cause that kind of drowsiness, but they're also usually alone. So again, so critical, turn the box around, see what you're actually getting. Intranasal and topical steroids, a lot of these are pretty new to the market. Uh, the fluticasone and triamcinolone are relatively recent uh, that children can uh, use these uh, intranasal steroids uh, for allergic rhinitis, things like that. And then hydrocortisone is, there's certain uh, strengths that you can use uh, that are okay uh, for children for uh, topical use, so some kind of cream or ointment. Uh, expectorant, antitussive, and decongestant. So an expectorant, something that helps bring up the mucus, and usually the squifenesin is in combination. And then the dextromethorphan, the DM, uh, this is an antitussive. It stops cough. And then decongestant, phenylephrine, usually abbreviated as the PE. But what we're going to see is, again, these medication names are really hidden. You have to look at the back of the box to make sure you're getting the medications that you need because sometimes the words on the front match what's on the back but you have to kind of get used to what the parlance is and then just some more miscellaneous medications the topical antibiotic neosporin is, has three parts bacitracin neomycin and polymyxin b and then uh, the anti-lice permethrin we'll talk a little bit about that and then the local anesthetic benzocaine so the goal is to give you a good idea of these 25 medications so that when you're going into the aisle, instead of knowing ibuprofen and Tylenol, you know 25 medications, you have a lot more confidence going into the aisle, but also you have confidence going to uh, the pharmacist to go talk to them about it, making sure that what you're getting is most appropriate uh, for your child. Uh, the resource audiences, 
Uh, I wrote Memorizing Pharmacology about a year ago. It was meant for my health professional students uh, and also nursing students, pharmacy students, physician assistant, and medical students have picked it up. It's a way to make pharmacology a little bit easier uh, because I come from a humanities perspective. I talk a lot about drug classes, drug classifications. But what I was getting was feedback that a lot of patients were getting it or people were getting it so that they could learn more about the medicines. And so then I wrote over the last year a new one, How to Pronounce Drug Names, A Visual Approach to Preventing Medication Errors. And this was meant for parents and for patients and for medication aides and medication managers. It's an entry into pharmacology without chemistry, uh, without having to have that road that a health professional takes. And it's out um, on Lulu, but uh, should be on Amazon uh, in the next couple weeks here. But I'm really excited about it because I think it really takes care of a need, which is we never really as a pharmacist, I would talk about the medication, but I would never hear my patient actually say the medication. And now, as things have really, really changed uh, since the Affordable Care Act, to we have a lot of self-care where patients are really reaching out um, and uh, wanting more information, wanting to be more empowered. And I think this is going to be a really empowering book that's going to hopefully prevent a lot of medication errors. So the next thing, uh, the next slide will be on a playlist, so it's not part of this video, uh, but I'm going to save 25 slides and then add them to this playlist.